Hey guys, this is Seth Williams. I'm here with Charlie Gell. He was gracious enough to give me a tour of his new storage facility. We're here in Nuevo, Michigan. And I've always been fascinated by this kind of thing, just seeing how it really works in the real world. Charlie's got a ton of experience and he's gonna dish out a lot of uh, value for us here today. How long have you been in the self-storage business? What's your history here? So uh, I've been in the self storage, uh, mostly on the operations side. I got my first exposure to it because my parents bought a self storage across the street from their apartment complex. Um, essentially, the owner across the street from the apartment complex we owned um, called my dad's accountant and because uh, he was the person of record on the um, LLC filing and said, hey, would you be interested in buying the storage facility across the street? And so we really didn't understand the concept, but I was like, well, it's going to be so easy to manage it right across the street. Let's go ahead and get into it. So um, okay. it's amazing how much the industry has changed. I remember we sold off at $45 a square foot, you know, decades ago. We thought that was the top of the market. And uh, now, you know, with technology, with software and call centers, uh, you know, gating systems, uh, it's amazing how much that can be managed just from your desktop computer these days. Okay, gotcha. And this place is in Nuevo, Michigan, right? How did you find this opportunity? Uh, it was uh, simply listed on the MLS. Um, you know, I, uh, I have an idea of what I can typically pay on a price per square foot basis. And so, uh, you know, I reached out to the realtor, which I knew fairly well, and then we offered on it. We had a, you know, a, a pretty clean offer of a high EMD, and so we got accepted right away. And this was a vacant lot when you bought it, right? Correct. Okay. So, well, actually, so, um, so if you can uh, kind of, well, it's actually hard to see, but we actually bought it as two lots. So it was roughly 20 acres, 10 acres for a single family lot, and then 10 acres for this lot so we bought them together and then what we did was uh, we did a lot line adjustment which so, some people would think it's a split but it's uh, slightly different so we borrowed essentially six and a half acres from that lot and combined it this one so we have 16 and a half acres for this facility okay so you can expand in that direction further correct if we do um it's going to be a uh, we would have to uh, change some things up uh because uh that area where you came in that's technically not an entrance at somebody else's lot mm -hmm. but we basically agreed to give them kind of basically a brand new lawn as a result for letting you use that so if we did that we'd have to make some changes to our layout mainly in drainage it, mainly like this area right here uh, we have to make drainage or if we ever decide to we still have that lot next door we could just build a second entrance from that lot over there okay gotcha and uh did you have to rezone anything when you bought this or it was just already zoned no nope, but uh, it was it was already zoned for it you know you still so getting up uh, uh certifications uh and, uh and permits were pretty easy um the only thing was you know there were certain ordinances we were trying to work around uh, mainly with the um, lighting and then also basically clearing trees. We wanted to clear trees a little bit closer to the actual uh, line. And, uh, and also uh, lighting, we were trying to get lighting that could spray outwards more mm -hmm. uh, because we have some bigger driveways that we want to make sure that we have entire coverage. So most cities want uh, lights that spray downwards. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if I have a 60 foot driveway, I have a 50 foot driveway, it's hard to spray downwards going out 60 feet. So then you either got to put a massive light pole, which they don't necessarily like, or you got to get it through the downwards. So we kind of told them that, you know, for purposes of safety and the best interest, uh, we need at least some of the driveways to have lights that spray outwards. Okay, gotcha. Now, Nuego, for those who don't know, uh, you know, it's a fairly small town and it's, you know, what I would consider a rural location. How did you determine that there was enough demand here to support a new facility? Yeah, so um, with, you know, tertiary markets, uh, you know, the, the main thing you want to look for is, you know, what, what are the numbers not telling you? So, like, we have, you know, um, we have storage facilities in some tertiary markets where the population on paper is, you know, 300 or 5,000. But then when you look closer at it, uh, you know, the student population is not considered into it. So like, you know, you look at Mount Pleasant, Michigan, it doesn't count, you know, one of the largest universities in the state as part of their population. So that's something to consider. Another one is that like, you know, we have an area with five lakes that uh, you, uh, you have a lot of wealthy people from Grand Rapids and Detroit that are going there. And so you look at the population at census data, I can guarantee you that at any given time that if you go there on a busy summer day, that that's that many people on one lake in the area too as well. Mm -hmm. So those are all things to consider. We also consider markets that are very close to a, a primary or tertiary market, which I consider this fairly close. And also areas that are gonna have significant investment. So if you look at this, uh, this area, you have three Fortune uh, 1500 companies that have invested almost a combined $80 million basically into their business infrastructure here. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna create uh, about 250 jobs for the area 
and then uh, one of those is actually Magna. We also have uh, the area's largest mobile home park across the street. We really have uh, kind of cornered an area that is uh, we believe that's going to grow because one of the few metrics I would never break is that I won't invest in an area that's got a declining population or that does not have a diverse labor growth. So if Magna was the only employer here and there are 65%, even the population was growing, we wouldn't do that as well because we don't want that type of risk exposure to one community. So, so it's diverse. We have, you know, although we have three major employers that represent a significant portion, we still have three of them. Um, the other thing too is that, you know, and we also have this, the, a lot of the traffic to this town comes out this way too as well. Okay, gotcha. And with somebody with your experience, did you did you order like a feasibility study to do this or do you know how to do that kind of thing yourself? So we, uh, we've been doing our own in-house feasibility studies for a while and then what happened was uh, is that we were ordering them just to kind of please the bank to say, hey, this third party that is a guru or professional is also um, basically agreeing with what we said. But then what eventually happened was we were giving our feasibility to any of the companies and they said you were copying it and then we were paying them 2,500 or 3,000 to copy exactly what we said. Yeah. And so fortunately the banks started also noticing that too as well. Um, and then also we also launched our own feasibility study in house too as well. So we do do feasibility studies for other people. Oh, okay. And so once we started doing those, uh, they really, the banks really stopped asking for it at that point in time because you know once you've started, we've done 50 of them yeah. and other people started seeing our work too as well. That I started being coming up work corresponded for the inside sales storage as well. Um, and also just because, you know, like we've, we've proven that we can build them. Uh, they, they really, we haven't had to do one in a while now. Gotcha. So, so you are a, and you're the general contractor on this project too, right? Yeah. So I do all the building construction management. One of our secret sauces for our investors is that uh, like on this job, I think I charge my investors $35,000 to manage it. Where I would say your typical contractor charge you closer to two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, a lot more than that. Yeah. For sure. So, so that's kind of a nice thing because right off the bat, that's dropping the price to build you know four to five dollars per square foot. Yeah. So you do feasibility studies. You've got experience owning these things. General con like, is there anything you don't do in the self storage world? Well, um, I, I, do I guess I don't do the actual feasibility studies really anymore. I provide the oversight to it. My staff actually does that. My staff also does a lot of the um, uh, building construction management side as far as managing logistics. I'm the one on site the most of the time uh, actually doing that, so that, that's a time consuming part for me. But for managing logistics, you know, just like a quick email here to make sure that they're communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, and actually that's another thing too as well I think we do is that um, our, my three main contractors, my electrician, my excavator, and my concrete guy, um, you know, that's, and obviously, uh, you know, obviously steel, but those are three out of my four biggest contractors. So they have guys that are actually, they're actually buddies that work well with each other. That's a huge plus for me because I know they communicate with each other. Whereas like um, my, I would say like, you know, for example, right now, my electrician and my camera guy, on this site, they've not been the greatest with following up with each other. You know, it's, it, you would think it wouldn't be hard for them to just say, hey, shoot me an email and the camera guy at the exact same time, shoot the electrician and me at the same time. So just little things like that, just making it sure it moves smoothly. But then my staff does a pretty good job of just following up with them. So we have certain calendar entries set up. So at, at a bare minimum, every two weeks, somebody's getting uh, notified of what's going on in progress. Even if it's, uh, hey, nothing's happened, we, we just wanna make sure that you know we're constantly keeping in touch with them. So that way later on it doesn't fall out and then, oh, hey, you know, I didn't realize you guys are gonna be done this fast, you know, sure. or whatnot. Gotcha. So. so Charlie, you would just tell me about uh, this drainage and yeah. some of the challenges and issues that came up with this. Why don't you just quick recap that again for us? Yeah, so I mean, if you wanna kinda of get closer here. Um, so like right there, you kinda of see the, the, it's already get washed out a little bit underneath the concrete right there. And so what ha was happening is that we have this whole facility on a 1% incline. Mm -hmm. But if you got 1% incline basically over 200 feet, what's happening is water is running so fast that it is running over this, and then it's eroding this area out, and then now it's eroding underneath the concrete too as well. So I'm standing basically on a, a drainage ramp essentially. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do to correct that is right now in the meantime, it's, it's, it's kind of rumbling this way. It's been kind of loud over there. Yeah. You essentially have a, a dirt curb right now uh, if, if it starts to rain. Well, once they're all done, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a curb there. So the curb will redirect all the water to the drainage ramps and then we won't have the issue. So, gotcha. and then all this you can see is really, really wide and shallow. 
Um, a lot of times people don't realize this, but they have good drainage, but they don't have good area for plowing snow or pushing right, it. Right, right. You probably see in the wood distance, we have a really deep retention pond. Yeah. No truck is going to push snow into that pond because uh, they don't want it to fall into the pond. Yeah. So what they'll do is they'll build one massive pile like five or six feet. And then the problem though is then you don't even have uh, an area to drain now because the you know, big snow is blocking it. Yeah. So by doing it this way, a lot of them actually push the snow into this ditch or mm -hmm. this shallow area. And then as it melts, it will actually bring into the drainage area as well. Because it's essentially filtering the water, right? Or the snow. Correct. Right, there's too many times I see uh, engineers do a really good job of drainage, but they make the drainage way too deep. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, we're, we're not going to have a, you know, a Noah's Ark flood hit this place like that. I get that we had to come from the worst case scenario, but it's way better for me to have shallow drainage that can be used for pushing snow mm -hmm. because that is the main use of this area about 90% of the time. It's having a place to put snow because you look at it like, well, well, we got we got 110,000 square feet of surface area that we're essentially going to be pond. Mm -hmm. um, and because you, you, the snow from the roofs are going to come down in the condo. So if I take 110,000 square feet times a one third of a, a one third because it's roughly, let's say four inches of snow, mm -hmm. I got to figure out a place to put 30, 35,000 cubic feet of snow. Mm -hmm. So so I got so when you think about that 30 35,000 cubic feet of snow is going to go here and then as that melts off it goes here and then if it melts off even more here what's nice is we're not blocking where that drainage goes to because we don't have a eight foot or a five foot pile of snow mm -hmm. so that's going to run into the curbs and then it's going to run into this so the drainage will still work even during the winter yeah because i find that happens at a lot of places they, they don't have a drainage plan period or the drainage is just poor yeah. and so they can get away with it sometimes because you have a lot of sand but then you'll see like you know I, i've had it before where i've been to a facility where i got stuck mm -hmm. and it's kind of like well hey dude like I got stuck in facility, you hump told me out. I'm like, well, that's not our problem. And it's like, well, I think it is because I shouldn't be getting stuck, you know, in yeah. your facility. So, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So if somebody didn't have this kind of space, what would they do? Just like pile up the snow right in the middle of the of the driveway or something? So as you can see, like with the, with the curb right here, we have kind of a turn down right here. When people plow, if we get four or five inches of snow here and you plow, What's going to happen is eventually, as you all know, is that like, um, you know, if you're at, at a, a have a um, house off the road, is that your driveway gets blocked in. Mm -hmm. And so that's the exact thing that happens with these units is they get basically the driveways are plowed, but then they got a four to six inch build up of snow right against their door. Mm -hmm. So one, that's not good because it freezes the seal up or makes the door hard. So then people are yanking on their door, warping it, trying to get it open. Mm -hmm. And two, when that snow melts, it could potentially go underneath the tool as well. Gotcha. So what we do is uh, we, we do it three different ways at our facilities, depending on if we have on-site management. The most preferred way, which is also the most expensive way, but it's also why we charge a dollar that facility, is we actually basically use a skid steer or essentially a bulldozer, and we actually use a huge shovel attachment, and we go up literally right up against it, and then they're going like three miles per hour. So like on a facility like this, it take them four to six hours to do. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is that they basically are going right up against the unit. They're actually, and then once they get to the point where they're starting to have snow accumulate, they lift it up like a shovel and then they, they drive all the way to that ditch and then they drop the snow in there. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't have that, then the other thing that we do essentially is we basically have a guy that actually is hand pushing a plow to plow like maybe about two to three feet away after the snow pile guys, and then he's basically just pushing it back into the middle. And then as that melts, or also because that's the least traffic area, as it melts, it'll just go down and drain. So it's hard to tell um, unless you like really walk it. But if you walk into this, you notice that we're going slightly downhill. So yeah. any that yep. melts is going this way. Yep. And so that's another thing too, is that we do have any build up that way. At least if it melts, it's gonna go that way. Whereas most facilities I see a lot of times is basically just completely flat. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to pay engineer or they don't want to have somebody basically uh, shoot the, uh, the elevations to have them go. And so they, they pull or they even sometimes start to, um, as people drive them, they start to actually um, go the exact opposite. They go back towards the units and the water gets underneath there. Because mm -hmm. the biggest thing when you are paying for quality, when you're paying for outdoor units, is uh, you're paying for your stuff to keep dry. Yeah. Like we spend, it, it's a very large five figure sum keeping the facilities dry just through plowing. Whereas if we were just like have some guy go through here in quick 30 minutes, plow everything, push it and do it that way, uh, that would be the fastest and cheapest way. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially we pass it off that cost to our customers, which we hope they understand that if they don't, 
that's fine mm -hmm. that you know we're doing this so you can keep your stuff dry sure gotcha and uh i, I don't even think we're talking how many total square feet is this thing going to be when it's all done uh, 52,600 square feet. Okay. So we got um, five uh, 40 by 200s uh, over here to my right. Mm -hmm. These last two buildings are uh, uh, going to be 14 by 30 units. So these will store boats, um, class B, C, R, V. And you notice the higher ceilings. Yeah. Uh, and these are 30 by 2 tents. Okay. And I noticed uh, in one of your other videos, I saw you were talking about the importance of the uh, the width of this drive line yeah. so people can back up. Yeah. So how how wide is this one and how do you determine how wide it needs to be? Yeah, so we got a 50 foot driveway here. Um, and then the other drive, so the driveway length, we, we will never go um, less than the building width. So I've seen some people do like 26, 25 foot driveways. Um, on our buildings, the unit, if the unit is 30 feet deep, we will not have anything less than that. So the bare minimum we'll do is 30 foot uh, driveway. Mm -hmm. I like to be closer to 1.2 to 1.5, depending on what they're in the store. Cause you look at it like, if I'm putting a boat there, okay, so that boat basically will take me to like right here. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm towing the boat also has to be counted for too as well. So like I, I have seen it happen so often where somebody's got a 30, 40 foot deep unit with a 30 or 40 foot wide driveway. And I'm not sure if you boat, but I'm not gonna be able to like do that. And I do, don't be honest, I don't want somebody to be skilled to get their stuff in there because yeah. if they're not skilled, they're gonna hit the units. Yeah, true. So, and so you probably see that strip right there actually. Um, well, we, we would assume that everybody would follow the plans. The reason why we haven't filled in that last strip is because there will be bower posts that are gonna go in. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna put the bower posts in first and then we'll put the concrete in afterwards. So that way then they're lined right with the unit so people can hit the, uh, the doors or the um, unit itself. Okay. So I like to be personally, uh, when I know it's gonna be boat RV stored, at bare minimum I like to be 1.5 or not closer to two X of what it is. So mm -hmm. if it's 30 feet deep, we got 50 foot driveways. If I can accommodate for it, I'd actually like to go 60 foot. But what we have on the other side is we have unlimited space on the other side. So if somebody does tell me that they want unlimited space or they want really, really wide, well, they're gonna have probably actually 80 feet of room on that side. Mm -hmm. So we'll just put them on that side instead of this side. And if they're starting to be smaller or if they're using this more as a contractor, so we'll do that over here. Gotcha. The other thing too is that um, it's gonna be hard to tell too as well, but you can kind of see the, uh, the infrastructure for it. But each of these units are actually gonna have a, um, their own electrical outlet. Uh, we charge them $25, so just on average what they actually cost us. So we don't do it as an upcharge. It's more just an um, a add-on to really keep retention because to be honest, nobody else offers it. Um, so that's another thing also we distinguish as well too, is that people are surprised that in every rural city, uh, there, is a, a, there is a group of people that are willing to pay for quality and a lot of times that doesn't get service. So all of our competitors in this area, they're all dirt driveways, all of them basically plow, you're not gonna be able to access your units. Um, so, you know, to go from dirt to a concrete driveway, not even asphalt. Um, I, uh, the idea is hopefully our customers will recognize that. And then also lighting too as well. I, I, I have no question by saying that this is gonna be the safest facility in the county. Um, we. Our lighting this place up as much as the city will allow us. If we don't light it up more, it's because the city is saying, hey, uh, we don't like the disturbance of your light. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, two thirds, you know, on average, maybe 60% of the renters are typically female. And we find that that's way more protective of them than having a gating system. Uh, because to be honest, like, um, I used to be really big on let's gate it out, let's keep them out, let's you know try and make it like a prison. But then what I realized is that if somebody really, really wants to access their stuff, they're gonna find a way by either coming in right after somebody else, or they're going to basically um, you know cut through the chain links. So we're not really super big out. We don't want to make it super easy for them where they can pull their car in. But if somebody, for example, like we're not gonna fence this area, but if somebody wants to drive over to that lot and go through the like you know 25 feet of trees go through a ditch and hand carry everything out to steal their stuff to be honest i'd rather them have, have easy access to take their stuff versus basically trying to like, like you know cut into the facility and break in and then basically cause a ton of damage gotcha because uh but if you like the facility up you have a ton of video surveillance that is significantly different that's what really makes the facility safe because if somebody comes in here with a car we're gonna catch a license plate because we, we get the most expensive cameras possible. Mm -hmm. And then secondly too as well, why would they come to this facility to basically steal something where we have one across the street that has no cameras, no lighting. It's just, it's just a path of least resistance for them essentially. They're not gonna go here to do that. And then yeah. also, 
you know, if you come here, both RV storage, th that would be the only thing I would say to here that we have that, you know, like if something were to come here, but it's not like they have the keys on site. So it'd be something so sophisticated that you wouldn't go after a facility. You probably would be going after a much larger facility. So it's just uh, overall, our, our biggest goal is that we just want to basically make sure that everybody that comes in and out, we know are aware of, and it's lit up well. Yeah. So we fencing is probably one of the things I feel is a little bit overrated on facilities, but um, for an insurance perspective, it is slightly cheaper when you have fencing. So do you have like a uh, comparison of like a f facility without a fence versus one with a fence? Like are there less incidents when it's just well lit without a fence? Or is it kind of the same either way? Yeah, or? so I, I have, um, not right now, but I have had facilities that are poorly lit. Um, and I can, uh, we actually, to be honest, we don't really run into instances in general. It's very, very few. The, the only time we have issues with theft, um, and, and knock on wood, I'll, you know, hopefully that doesn't yeah. change. The only instance, we've only had two instances and it was basically somebody trying to break into their own unit. One, they failed uh, because one, they realized they were caught on camera. And so then they try to act like it happened. And then we came through, I'm like, oh, okay, this door is destroyed. It looks like somebody tried to plow, uh, pull it from the other side. Mm -hmm. And then they denied it. And so then we basically filed a police report up for them and then they ended up paying us back for it. The other one um, basically broke into the unit by, um, they essentially cut out around the latch we got their stuff, which was crazy, and we still, uh, um, and that one, um, actually, you know, that one we did not catch them because uh, that one had poor coverage. The light was poor at the facility. Um, and that was actually, uh, we had just taken over for a few months. And that one that was kind of crazy is that um, I think we got into that unit because we were going to auction them. And they had like 200 bucks of stuff. So, oh, wow. <laughs> which that's another reason why, too, as well. Like, we don't want to go after, like, I, uh, so, one of the things that we want to go after is people that are willing to pay for quality because um, they're, they're not going to risk basically that. Like if they, somebody has an RV and they have all this stuff that they're stored that's really expensive, they're less likely to risk the reputation to save a few hundred bucks to do that essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. you no, know, it's kind of like if I'm, you know, my multifamily, like there's certain areas that I try to stay with. I don't want to be in a high crime area because I want to make sure that one, I'm protecting the people who are storing there that want quality. And also too, I want to protect my investors because we don't, we, we don't, we can't, it's hard to, you don't want to have a budget or a line item for robberies and stolen because that's actually what historically is representing the area. So if I see that, if I see a really high crime area, I wouldn't do that. Or, you know, um, uh, the other thing about it too as well is that there's a statistic I, it's pretty old now, but I, I still remember it to this day, but a national average at one point was nine months of inventory per unit. So what that means is that if I'm paying $100 for this unit, I'm only storing $900 of stuff into it. Hmm. So if you imagine like, you know, if I got somebody paying $299 for this, but they're storing an RV in it or a boat, they're well above that 9X limit. And I, I can tell you that relationship of what they store versus whether they go to auction, that's a direct thing. So the majority of one time we have auctions, it's five by 10 units or it's 10 by 10 units, they're storing clothes. Mm -hmm. But when I got somebody storing pianos or RVs or vehicles, uh, they never, ever, ever default on their units. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why we like to go after it too. Gotcha. It's less headache, it's less moving parts, and, and most, almost all the time, it's better on paper. So mm -hmm. it's uh, when you build a class A facility, um, it may not be as great a return, but it, it almost stays much more predictable, which is why I like it. Yeah. Is this considered Class A right here? Uh, I would say this is a Class A uh, facility in uh, a Class B or C area. Okay, gotcha. So. Tell me about these buildings. What company did you use to do the buildings and the doors? Yeah, so uh, we uh, used Peak Steel for this one. I've used uh, a number of different companies. Uh, that just happened to be the one that we used for this one. Mm -hmm. And then the doors right now, which are actually on back order, um, are, are through TrackRite, which is a track key product. Gotcha. Normally, Peak actually pairs with Janssen, but for this project, um, at least it was supposed to be the timeline was better for us to use TrackRite doors. That's okay. why we went with them. Gotcha. And Peak is, what state are they located in? I uh, don't know. I think they're looking uh, down south. Okay. So, so they, they basically manufacture them and then drive them up here yeah. and they have their own crew that puts them all together? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. They had their own crew, but I contracted my own crew out because we just had better pricing. Oh, okay. Using gotcha. my own crew. So. Alright. Yeah. But the crew that does this, they do uh, a lot of plug them on uh, complete metal buildings. Uh, they do quite a bit of um, storage and they're also Michigan based. So just from that standpoint of having labor in Michigan to do uh, 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 saved out significantly. 
know, like yeah. or if I was getting somebody from Illinois or Indiana, I'm essentially I'm paying for those guys to come up here and stay in a hotel, essentially. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Um, and w w what is your plan with this thing? Are you going to, like, sell it off once it's done, or are you going to keep it long-term and, and manage it? Or? The, the plan, uh, well, so it's hard to say because uh, with self-storage, uh, if you're filler, uh, familiar with accelerated depreciation, uh, we can, you know, depreciate these essentially 20, 22 percent that first year. And so a lot of times after like seven years, we've run out of stuff to depreciate. And so then now we're getting taxed on it. So there's always that tendency to kind of want to sell at that point in time because now we're getting taxed on all the income. Yeah. But uh, we'll buy. We, we, we are building this facility with the intent to keep it long term. That's one of the reasons why we went with concrete. It's a more expensive product. But I mean, we're not going to have to do anything for 30 years on this. Thing. Yeah. Whereas asphalt, probably, you know, 15, 20 years. I'm gonna have to replace it. So, yeah. how much more expensive is concrete versus asphalt right now? Uh, you know, it varies a ton because uh, bet uh, petroleum-based products yeah. like asphalt can vary. Totally. If you go with two, oh, so uh, well, there's three things that vary. It depends on the aggregate. Mm -hmm. So, if I have a lot of sand or gravel on site and I'm not bringing it in, that's big because you need, you know, two to three times more more aggregate for. Um, uh, for asphalt, mm -hmm. so so people don't realize that cost. So if you look at just asphalt versus um, concrete, you're like, wow, it's uh, it's more expensive. But then, um, if you look at all the total costs mixed in, primarily with the aggregate, it, right now I'd say it's only about 10 to 15 percent more. Yeah. Um, but that number varies quite a bit because uh, my concrete just took an increase in cost. Which one of the things I will tell you is that um, surprisingly, one of my least um, volatile um, line items is my concrete. For some reason, we've been able to stay relatively close. I think I'm finally at uh, paying about 22% more than what I was two years ago. Mm -hmm. But at steel, at one point, I went from $13 a square foot to $19 a square foot, less than six months apart. Oh, wow, man. Um, so, so, so that was a huge jump. And then my petroleum products, I think at one point I went from like $1.20 to like $1.80. Mm. Um, so so that, that varied quite a bit too. So I know that sounds like a big jump for concrete and you know, a, a year and a half, two years, but that was one of the least volatile items. You know? okay. And that was another thing that made it really difficult to build these things is because stuff is changing constantly and then you know i might have it where my concrete guy you know quotes me something next uh you know six months ago and i'm good with it and then he comes back to me with a price increase because he can't start until march because you know we got snow on the ground and then you gotta deal with that so you know we we have to over project quite a bit so i'm uh, on my performance um, it's been working out that we've been outperforming by you know 15 to 12 percent on mm -hmm. our on our budget because we've been uh, having to assume the worst case scenario with a lot of these price increases. Gotcha. Now property management, how do you handle that? Are you using a uh, software or company? Or are you handling everything yeah, in house? So, uh, we have uh, in house management. Um, property management is uh, I, people ask me to manage uh, their facilities all the time, and to be honest, it's not very profitable, so we just don't want to add that in. You know, mm -hmm. like. Uh, because you know they want some uh, you know a company that's going to basically do it for like forty dollars an hour, but to manage it well, I got to pay somebody twenty five dollars an hour. So to operate off a fifteen dollar hour margin, it mm -hmm. just it just doesn't make sense for us to do it. The only time we do it is when like the client is somebody that has been like a paid uh, I have a paid consulting degree or something, or I'm helping them for six months, but then they're gonna to transition to in-house. So mm -hmm. that's the only time that we do that. But our in-house management is really two people. Um, and then we have a call center and then we have a software that manages that too as well. Now for the, the unit mix, like the number of units and sizes of units here, how did you decide what to do with that? I, I know there's big units here, there's tiny little closet size units. What's the rationale? Yeah, do you just so look I at mean, the competitors? There's national averages, uh, you know, that kind of we, that we use kind of as a guideline, but the biggest things are feasibility. You know, mm -hmm. like if I see that five by tens are getting $75 a square foot and mm -hmm. 10 by 300s are only getting, you know, 50 cents a square foot, I'm not gonna build 10 by 300s, mm -hmm. you know, unless I see that the demand is so high. I mean, there's no 10 by 30s within 20 mile radius then what that tells me is, you know what, it's probably just people aren't testing the market to increase it. So yeah. we'll build some of them as a test, and then for future phases, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll basically do that based off of price versus demand and also waiting list. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, we talked about those 14 by 30s over there. Um, anytime I introduce a new size on a phase two in an existing facility, or if I have one close by, what we do is we offer unit sizes on wait lists that we don't even actually have. And then if we get like, so let's say I want to offer 14 by 40, 14 foot ceiling, classy RV products. There is none of that product anywhere within like 20, well, 
Closest one is probably about 45, 50 miles away. Um, it's expensive to build. I don't know if I can get the price per square foot I need, however, even though I know people would use it. So if I put that out at the price per square foot that I need, so let's say that I need to make 395 off of that unit. We put it on our website at 395. And then if we get a wait list of 30 people, when I go back to the, uh, the bank, you know, especially if I'm not somebody that does feasibility studies for a living, and they say, well, hey, have you had a feasibility study or what makes you think you can get this? I don't have to say I think it. I can just say, well, I have a wait list. We called them all last week. All 30 of them are willing to pay us 395 for this unit, and we can have it built in six months. Mm -hmm. That's a very easy conversation to say that you've already substantiated the demand. Yeah. So whenever we can, we substantiate the demand of actual real-time numbers, just like anybody else will. Gotcha. And is this one a syndication? Uh, no, uh, this one we have a uh, we have a note investor on this one. Okay. But uh, we just have a, a debt structure on this. So my partner and I own this deal 100%. Okay. But you have done syndications, right? Done syndications, and uh, I have there's benefits to each one I like. Um, mm -hmm. But um, well, you know, like for example, like one of the things I really liked about this facility is that we talked about price per square foot. Mm -hmm. uh, on paper, five by tens make more money. They're more expensive to build, but they get a really high price per square foot. The downside about we talked about it though is that they also go to auction more, they have more in and outs because it's very easy to move 50 square feet of stuff. I can just do that in the trunk of my vehicle. Mm -hmm. If I have a 10 by 30, I gotta get a U-Haul to move it. Chances are I'm, I'm staying there longer term or I am only stored for a few months because I'm transitioning between houses. Mm -hmm. So 10 by 3, uh, 30 is lease up slower, but they also stay a lot longer and they're also a lot less to manage. So we like to do the bigger unit sizes, but sometimes we have to do our unit sizes so on paper they look better because the banks like the return on paper of a smaller unit and so do the investors too as well. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have to worry about that tendency. We could do solely what we thought was gonna be best for us, uh, which also is basically holding long term. We believe doing more bigger units would be better for us. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I like doing, you know, when I don't have to answer to investors, um, that's a nice thing to add to it as well. The other thing about it too is that I don't have to basically track these numbers like on a weekly basis. I don't have to do video reports. I don't basically have to do you know, all these updates with that. So it's a significantly less more work to it as well. And to be honest, you know, people look at other people's money as the golden, you know, the holy grail. You, you are working for somebody else. You have to have a, a very high responsibility. So yeah. ultimately, I'm working for somebody else. I'm a multimillionaire working for people that are making less than me, yeah. you know, to, to make things simple. And so some people may not have that, but I have that, I have that attitude. So that's also why a lot of times I do like to do my own deals where I just use my own money. I don't have to answer to anybody else. Mm -hmm. If I want, I don't want to look at the facilities numbers for three weeks, oh well, great. I'm the person that's only going to be mad when I come back, you know, if, if something happens. Whereas my other facilities, the longest I'll go is maybe two weeks without diving through the data. Yeah. So that's just kind of, you know, a plus and minus there. But I will tell you though also, some of our clients do get really, really, our clients and investors, they get really mad. Like, hey, why didn't you bring us on this deal, Charles? Uh -huh. And it's like, well, you know, that's kind of part of the reason why. You mm -hmm. know, it's, uh, I just, I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. I didn't want to have to keep thinking about what does this look like to the investor? Or, hey, I want to build five by tens because that gets us to a higher return on paper or, for example, the five by tens fill faster, so the investors want to get paid as early as possible, but if I do 10 by 30s, they can be a little bit more patient. I can hold off on paying return to myself, you know, maybe a six months or a year later. Mm -hmm. So you gotta always factor those things because investors don't wanna wait three years. Some of them are very patient and we have a lot of those investors too. That's the investors I prefer. Um, but you know, you, you, you always gotta you know, keep that investor in mind that if I can get to a 8% or a 6% or whatever return faster, with faster fill ups, even though that might sacrifice some of the long term that does that. And so this facility, everything that we did was solely focused on the long term. We're not thinking about how it's gonna perform year one and two. Mm -hmm. We're really looking at year three, four, and five, which is also why we went in concrete. Yeah. Because if I had investors on this, I would have probably done asphalt. Yeah. Sounds like it's probably would you say less stressful to just do it yourself instead of having a syndication with investors? Um, well, I mean, it depends because I know if I'm writing a million dollar check at my own bank account, that can be pretty, yeah, <laughs> that can that's be true. pretty Good stressful point. too as well. So, you know, that's why I like having a combination of it. So if I'm cash heavy and I can do the deal myself, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Another thing about it too as well is that like, um, 
you know, one of the things I did early on, which was helpful, is that um, when I was raising money from other investors, I didn't need their money. Mm -hmm. So there was no stress in that I have to raise their money and I have to do these deals. Mm -hmm. And so my partner handles most of the investor raise. And so that allows me to really just be 100% focused on these deals. Um, our structure is also very, very low fee base. We have very low fees on this deal. Like to be honest, my partner and I will really make you know hundreds of dollars a month on all these uh, on this all these units here, uh, or a lot of other deals. But then we also have you know 30 to 50 percent equity. We have a lot more equity than I think other uh, GPs would normally take. Uh, but ultimately, it kind of is like, well, how do you want it? Because the GPs that take only 10 or 20 percent. You know, and the LPs get 80% of the deal, they might take 6% management fee, 2% asset management fee, disposition fees, and all these fees. Whereas, you know, I just mentioned a second ago, you know, I think this facility, I'm paying myself $35,000. I'm paying myself less than a dollar a square foot yeah. to basically yeah, do this much. entire build. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, it just depends on how you want to structure it. So our investors, I think, are, are cognizant of that. They also like that they have access to us. You know, like if they're calling me every week, even though they could, mm -hmm. I probably won't ever let them invest in one of our deals again. Mm -hmm. But uh, they know they could if they wanted to. Yeah. How many facilities have you worked with, like in your entire career? Like, what number is this? Uh, I should know that number because I, I've consulted in various uh, roles. So one of the things I really did to kind of just get experience to build my resume up is that, like, let's say that you're a self-storage facility owner and you own uh, a rural area where you know everybody you grew up to high school with them. What I would do is I'd be like, listen, I, you know, like, I know that you, you we talked about um, you sell the facility to me. It doesn't sound like you're ready, but... You know, let me do you a favor. Um, I think I can raise your rents 25% and I can basically charge you a fee that you'll basically make back in like six months. And in every case, it was like a complete no brainer for them. But essentially what would happen is that, um, let's say that you're the you know exhausted owner where Billy's mom is saying, oh, hey, I got paid for his braces. Can you like, can I pay you late, you know, for the next three months or whatnot? We would come through, essentially manage it. We jack the rents up to what they actually should be, even if they're significantly higher than what they're paying now. We take the brunt of everything, and then six months later, previous owner comes back, knight in shining armor. Everybody loves him. We make the we make the um, tenants feel bad for him because we're kind of like you know he got exhausted where people were calling him at midnight, stopping by his house to drop by a cash payment, you know, even though he wanted you to drop it off on site. And then essentially, then you know they would basically make our fee back over three months of rent raises. So I did a lot of deals like that where I was just, you know what, let's get this experience because I want to I want to get this operations piece. So then when we really started doing our own deals, I basically got to learn on all the people's sites. So I did probably about five or six of those. Um, I manage and own four facilities right now. We've done five new constructions. I've consulted or built it myself in the last two years. Um, and then I've done consulting on probably about 20 clients over the last two years too as well. Gotcha. And all that stuff is in West Michigan somewhere? Um, a lot of it's West Michigan, but I have a lot of clients. I actually prefer to take clients nationally mm -hmm. uh, outside of Michigan versus the Midwest. Um, I do have holdings outside of the state too as well uh, because then that way I don't, I'm not worried about Competing with my own clients. Yeah, because I, don't, I don't want to be paying some, getting paid, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars by somebody on how to basically, you know, build a facility and then take it start to finish and then come lo and behold, they buy a plot of land I was thinking to buy myself where I could make significantly more mm -hmm. and also create passive income for myself on. Yeah, sure. So um so I don't really advertise that aspect of my business to be honest. Uh, I, I actually turn down more people mm -hmm. um than I actually accept as clients on that side of the business. Gotcha. Now do you ever work with climate controlled storage? Yeah, so climate control has really changed a lot on how basically building them more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a consultant on climate control, mostly conversions, and we also have done some stuff with ground up. That's been more limited, but I do see that there's going to be a lot more uh, climate control storage because, you know, we talked about, so like these units right here, I mean, you see right here, um, these, this last piece hasn't gone up yet. But I mean, you can just see right here, like they're not entirely enclosed right here. So yeah. you got this little gap right here. Well, the problem is that there's airflow constantly going through this. And so you know this, but like if I, if I leave my car outside and the temperature drops significantly overnight on a summer night, there's a good chance that I'm gonna have condensation on that window when I wake up in the morning. Well, lo and behold, we got steel. And so even though I basically, you know, you see that I have condensation control up there, there's a good chance that, you know, I have warm air that hits this and cold 
that is going to kind of see you right. I can't control that. So people will act like, you know, we're not doing a good job controlling for condensation. I can do as much as I can. I can control rain, I can control stroll, but I can't control condensation. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the ways I do see that self storage, a climate control will take over. I think in the past, banks did not look at it as recession resistant because, you know, one nice thing about this facility is that if I'm only 10% occupied in this facility, my utility costs are very low on it. You know, I just really have lighting. And to be honest, actually, I can change my lighting up where I only light up two buildings that I even want to do as well. Whereas with climate control, you know, if I don't have a lot of uh, uh, climate control zones, or, um, I might have a very significant cost heating up like, you know, 120,000 square feet. So now, now you really do have to lease up, but I definitely think that's starting to change. Um, and then also the other thing about it too is well, you know, if you're storing electronics, like you're just kind of going back to the example, like you're not storing outdoor entirely, but you are getting some exposure to the outdoor elements, you know, when you have these units. Yeah. So you really need to make sure that like, um, you know, uh, on our end, we do whatever we can, but I, I really like having uh, hybrid products. So, like we had a facility that we managed um, that we also consulted on um, that um, the owner basically only had indoor and we basically said, you know, you need pods, you need to have some outdoor too as well as outdoor storage because they really help sell. Because, mm -hmm. you know, for us, like um, we, we are uh, heavy on sales, but you know, it's amazing that like, you know, what people don't do, but when we tell people like, hey, you know, what are you storing? A lot of call centers don't ask that. And then when they say, well, I got office equipment or I'm storing like some type of electronics, and I'm like, and, and how long are you gonna store this for? You know, and they're like, you know, a couple of months, you know, I'm like, to be honest, I, I would pay 20% more to protect a $3,000 computer. I mean, you go back to that rule, nine months of inventory. Mm -hmm. Why would you not pay $20 more a month to protect a $3,000 computer? So, mm -hmm. so those are things that, you know, we, we are always looking into as well. The other thing that we have to consider too as well is how much more are you gaining off of that climate control? Some markets, you're only getting 10% more. Some markets, you're getting 40% more because, you know, I mean, like if I did a feasibility study in Nuevo right now, there's obviously no climate control. Mm -hmm. So, so now, so we'll, but we'll get an idea of that type of customer because essentially what we can do again, like what we talked about is we can basically put a climate control unit on a wait list and see how many people get. Yeah, sure. So that's that's so that's the kind of another way we, we test yeah, the market. That's a good idea. Because I can again, I can have uh, if I if I wanted to, um, that whole uh, six and a half acres I have over there. Mm -hmm. If we do get the demand for it, then that's exactly what we'll do. Yeah. We'll build that out. And that right there, that's all bonus for us right there because yeah. that all came on this lot. So. Yeah. And that big gravel area that we were at before, how many parking spots are going to be there? And what size are they? Is it? 12 by 30 or something? Yeah, so we do, uh, um, so uh, it depends on who you ask, but uh, I've seen anybody mark them off as eight by 30 or eight by 32 to mm -hmm. 12 by 40s. Okay. Um, so uh, eight, not that these could be wider than eight, but I, what I don't want is I don't want somebody that does not know how to back their RV, try to back into an eight foot space when I got $200,000 RVs on both sides. Yeah. That's not an ideal scenario. So we give them 12 feet, but then, um, and obviously this is gonna be our first year, so the first year will still be slower and each year we'll get more. But then we might have to go back through and, if, and because then obviously if I'm giving somebody 12 feet instead of eight feet, we do lose a lot of efficiency there. But again, we're, we're targeting quality, we're not targeting uh, quantity. So uh, we, we like to, we're gonna give them 12 feet. So right now this year we'll do is we'll, we'll mark them off cones and lines and we'll have like eight at a time and then we'll mark them through. And then as we basically figure out, okay, this is the layout, this is the type of unit mix we're getting. We're getting a lot more class A RVs versus class Bs then we'll actually put permanent bumpers down. But okay. again, going back to price, permanent bumpers made of rubber, petroleum based, those actually have gotten almost more expensive than concrete bumpers now, actually they are. So we might even do concrete bumpers now too as well. Mm -hmm. So we might find that we have a very strong mix of both. So then I might have a class B CRV row. So I have a row that this row right here is gonna be 10 foot wide for class B RV and boats. This row, which gives you more, more space, is gonna be more expensive. That's only gonna be a class A RV. Mm -hmm. If we find it's only like 20, then I probably won't do anything really crazy. I won't put a significant system in there. But we have so much space in there that we have a lot of room to basically make changes. So the, a lot of them that will leave, will leave uh, because they're, they're storing um, their items for only a temporary period of time. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna do at this facility that is different is that um, wherever they store, 
we require that it be operational so they can't store a bus that's not working or you know like we had a fi two fire trucks at a facility oh. that were not operational that we had to move and the guy could not get somebody to tow two fire trucks because of the weight and it was mm -hmm. the biggest pain ever so so that's one thing um Two, we do also uh, re have, uh, have requ a requirement that they have a certain amount of time to respond to us to move their items in case we have to excavate or change the layout. Um, and then uh, one of our facilities, we actually require them to leave a copy of a key on site, but that one's a staff facility, so, so they really shouldn't have an issue with that one. Mm -hmm. um, and then third, we also have a copy of their registration and also their lien holder as well. Mm -hmm. So going back to that example, we talked about nine months of inventory. If I got somebody that's storing a $100,000 RV, they're behind $2,000 a month, they're gonna pay me. But if they don't pay me, I'm gonna go back to their, I'm gonna basically uh, take it from them and then I'm gonna go back to their lien holder and say like, listen you need to pay me for this if you want to take it off site or else you're gonna lose it all together and so yeah. the lien holder will pay me at that point in time okay so at what point is it worth uh, constructing a structure to store an RV I've heard people have a harder time getting a return on that have you found that to be true or is it ever worth doing that or just yeah, so, uncovered storage uh, so there's a uh, there's a, a lot of good things to that too because um, you know one thing that people will say too that you can also argue and if I'm arguing on our side is that class A RV boat if somebody's got a hundred thousand RV, somebody's got a sixty thousand dollar boat. That's also the first thing that they get rid of too. Mm -hmm. So that there's also some truth to that too as well. But I would also argue too as well that somebody who has a Class A RV in a boat, um, there's a good chance that some of those people too are going to be the least affected by a, a, a recession essentially. Because I mean, you got to look at like. You know, I, uh, just be honest, like I, up until like six years ago, maybe, I, I just because I, I grew up poor, I, I grew up being a sous have road operator, I would still have nightmares about like, you know, being poor. Like, I mean, uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, just a lot of things I would do, you know, like, you know, you're looking at like, you know, trying to save 12 bucks with coupons at Meijer, you know, yeah. or whatnot. And, but then, you know, I, I, you know, when I really looked at it, I'm like, you know, my family, you know, we're in the top, you know, we'll say 1%, 3%, whatever, but if we were really struggling, imagine what the 97% of, of, of the population under us, they must be really struggling. Mm -hmm. So there is some truth to that too, but that would also be the counter argument too, is that some of these people, they're not affected by, and, and actually to be honest, when we had a lot of shutdowns with COVID, our, actually our company thrived. We had a slowdown for two months, which was awesome because I, I went on a 37 state tour of all the national parks. So I got a lot of time off. But after that two month slowdown, I mean, we pretty much grew. We, 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 ex we multiplied our business significantly. So, mm -hmm. so you know, that, that's a consideration there with the RV. But the biggest thing you're just looking at is, you know, how much does it cost me to build? And what can they rent for? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we went with the 14 by 30s on most of our units as an introductory unit size because 14 by 30 is relatively smaller. And so um, you get a good idea of that. But if they lease out really, really well, then we can introduce 14 by 40s. And a lot of times you can go back to those 14 by 30 clients and say, hey, would you have interest in a 14 by 40? You know, or again, that's how you get, you, you test the market. So, mm -hmm. or, you know, sometimes I have clients in other, a, a competitor that are, you know, is in a market close by and I'll just, I'll just simply call them up because I, one thing I will say is I know all of the facilities owners west of West Michigan, if you split the state in half, my staff and I have talked to them at some point. And so we, we know a lot of people, we have a lot of goodwill. Uh, if owners call me up, a lot of times I'll try to help them, you know, with the, just the, you know, the premise that, hey, when you sell, you know, give us, make sure that we had the last chance and the first chance to say yes or no on it. You know, if we don't say no, that's fine. If you get, get, a, get a higher price, we totally understand. But, you know, if I, I just hope that, you know, all we've done, you know, all the goodwill we've built up, you know, helping you with facilities, helping you with efficiencies, that you would also turn around and, you know, sell it to us, you know, at a fair price if that would have happened. So. Gotcha. Well, what other questions should I be asking you that I haven't asked you yet? Anything else that uh, is noteworthy about this place that you want to share? Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's go here, actually. Sure. One of the things that I, I find is a lot of people, uh, I used to be this way, too. I'm very analytical. Mm -hmm. Is that I, I, I'll, I'll say desktop warrior. That, that might be a little bit offensive. But uh, people that are on their desktop analyzing everything, analyzing numbers. So you, you, uh, you got to get out. So we see here, this is actually all native, actually, all the sand for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, we, uh, we, so th this right here, what you, what you need to see is that you need to get out. The best time to get out to your site is right after a heavy rain. I want to see what that site looks like after a heavy rain. If I come out here and we had four inches of rain last, uh, yesterday, and the site looks like this, 
that is awesome. That means I have great drainage. That means my excavating costs are gonna go down. So I can be anywhere from 60 to $150,000 an acre excavating, depending on the quality I have. So that's one thing I wanna know. You can't see that kind of in general from you know soil maps because those are public data, mm -hmm. but sometimes they don't match up. Or we bought a site before one time where the soil map said it was sand. And then we found out that the owner used it as a clay dumping site <laughs> for his all his other sites. So when we went through, we're like, what the heck is going on here? This is clay, and this clay is not native. Mm -hmm. It looks like. Well, we found out that the reason why that site was kind of useless till we got so cheap was because uh, there was a lot of clay. And what made it even worse is we had soil borings done, and those soil borings were done in a manner that, for some reason, did not capture. So we said, okay, there's some clay in this area but it happened to be right in between two or four soil borings that there was a super heavy deposit of clay in. And so our soil borings didn't catch it. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. We probably could have caught that better with that, but to be honest, the reason why um, it didn't catch it as well was because um, the clay was actually making it drain to the sand area so well. So that was one reason we catch it. Hmm. The other thing too as well is that people don't look at the um, layout. But our driveway essentially is gonna go right across the driveway from this mobile home park entry right there. Mm -hmm. So people refer to the city as one collective. The city is not one collective. The city is MDOT or the Department of Transportation. It's the health department, which can even tell you where to place the mailbox. Um, you got basically the zoning, you got, you know, warning current, you got Eagle, you got so many different areas that. And so on this one, um, oddly enough, I guess I can't remember if it was this one or another project, but um, some projects, the driveway placement is the health department, which I don't know why, but most of the time it's the Department of Transportation. So our driveway placement is right here, which is right across from that. Mm -hmm. If that driveway was 40 feet that way, I guarantee you that the township would make me put the driveway smack in the middle of all these buildings here. Now, if you can see that, that would be a nightmare yeah. to have to build twice as many pads, twice as many buildings, twice as many baller posts, and a whole other driveway straight through. Yeah. So that can ruin it too, because sometimes we look at sites and we're like, well, what is the rule of thumb? I'm like, well, it's hard to say what the rule of thumb is because I don't know if you're placing your driveway in the best spot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the driveway placement makes it where you can't do a great layout for your buildings. Mm -hmm. Or I gotta go back to them and say, listen, I know the zoning allows for self-storage, but the ordinance is for placing my driveway. So that's one thing right there. So that, that's a big one. You gotta, you gotta see it. You guys are on a Google Earth, that driveway actually doesn't even show up. Uh, I got so, you. So, that, so that's one thing. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Right here too, you see these electrical lines too as well. They also don't show up on the Google Earth. They're not gonna show electrical pole that then. Mm -hmm. So when I'm right here, I wanna see where my electrical placement falls. So actually, you actually just noticed it. That electrical pole is brand new. We actually had to move that about 30 feet over to put the driveway in. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So How much did that cost? We had to look at it too. It's like, well, okay, is it more feasible then for me to move my driveway all the way over to that side and move the electrical pole and change my layout? It wasn't. That electrical pole only cost me about $12,000 to move. Okay. Honestly, those are the biggest things that you got to get on site when you do your layouts. Too many people think they can do everything for the computer or they're trusting somebody that they're paying $30 an hour to do that. That's a that's a six figure basically planning mistake right there possibly, you know, with these things right here. Yeah. Uh, it potentially could be millions of dollars, you know, if, if the facility is big enough, but it's easily a six figure, it could be a high six figure mistake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, cause like right over here where you entered, that's actually a service driveway right there. We're using that, but uh, if I were to put it there, that would have been a real mess because then I would have been right at the edge of the drainage. Mm -hmm. So, and then also, you know, too as well, like uh, when we did this lot line adjustment, by making this lot bigger, the city wanted us to move the driveway then across from that one because, oh, well, your bigger lot, that's the most convenient driveway for us. And we're like, well, we can't do that location because if we do that location, it's gonna completely throw off our drainage and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then we have to do, uh, we, we have to have all our contractors re-quote. So he said, so we basically asked them for a lay, uh, layout. And so what we found was we moved our lot line 10 feet over to basically use it as an excuse that, oh, well, we can't move our driveway there now because it will encroach on our driveway. Mm -hmm. so, so that was our workaround, is that we just basically moved our lot line 10 feet over to make the parcel just small enough where we couldn't ha we, they, they couldn't make us move the driveway there. Because mm -hmm. we had two options. We could basically get um, uh, basically a, a special use permit to do that, which would basically take us to the drying table one or two months away, or 
We just did a lot line adjustment where we make it where that's not even possible to meet their ordinance requirements, which is what we did. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that people, to be honest, people think storage super simple. It's yeah. you know concrete, steel, but there's a lot of little things that you make that you make a mistake. So like you know when we charge a client, you know a high five figure amount to do that. To be honest, in all cases, it, it pays it, it pays for itself yeah. easily because I've I've made I've made luckily I've never made a six figure mistake. I've made five figure mistakes before, and my staff has made five figure mistakes before too. Where you know assumptions that were made that they did, you know they they made that, but. Ultimately, you know, if you could pay someone to consult you to really know what the layout, and that's why I think a lot of my clients come from the Midwest because I know I know these ordinances as well. I know frost laws, like people don't even know what frost laws are in the state, so just things like that. So yeah, I've found uh, in my limited experience, like working with civil engineers, architectural engineers, structural engineers, there's there's so many little details that uh, surprisingly they, they don't know. Like it, you kind of do need yeah. a storage you expert. Think they do and they don't yeah. agree, you know. And that's why, like you know, my engineers, like luckily, I, uh, my engineers at work when are fairly um, good about being practical. But one of the things that used to drive me nuts, and uh, um, I had a, a guy from a large irrigation company out here, and he's like, "Man, your drainage is awesome." is that a lot of them like to put these super f steep ditches and I'm like, stop putting these steep ditches in because my, my concern is not really drainage, mm. it's pushing the snows, you know? Yeah. So then you get these mass and then that's just completely useless too. And then later on, if we build that out, for me to fill that area in really quickly, mm -hmm. it's gonna be super easy to me find, having to find enough dirt to fill in a super deep ditch, you know? So it's gonna make the expansion easier as well, so. Yeah. But when you mentioned like five figure mistakes, like, what is one of those five figure mistakes? Just out of curiosity. Not calling out the electrician on time, not having planning. So like, uh, we'll, we'll go over just one of them. This is the most common one that I see a lot of people time in here. Um, so you see this right here. Um, you're gonna have to come yeah. in here to see it. So the spring basically is gonna go right here, but this is also where they're gonna line their conduit up for the electric. So you notice that all these doors are open on all facilities. Mm -hmm. The reason that is one of the last steps is because if I put my conduit now, Super easy, I'm just running right through, no problem at all, and that's why they have this little gap there too as well. Mm -hmm. If they put those up, and then they put the door up, now I gotta get my conduit behind that gigantic spring, which is like you know, eight to 12 inches wide. Oh, right. It just makes it a huge mess for them. And, so, yeah. and you're literally gonna quadruple your labor charge yeah, now. I see that. So that's a five inch mistake right there. Wow, oh, man. You know, so. That's a good example of those little, uh, just, Details that, yeah, he's in a mess. So that's why a lot of people think they can do it. Like, oh, you can do this, and you just assume the contractor, but you do have to manage your contractors a lot. You got to be on site, or like, you know, for example, like, so like uh, my concrete guy, um, I am on top of him, but when we talked about the curbs right there, if I wait till the very last second, I'm like, hey, can you do your concrete curbs? A guy that is pouring a 100,000 square feet concrete job, I can guarantee you he's not motivated to pour 400 linear feet of curbs. That's hmm. We'll just, we'll just keep it real there. Yeah. He's, he's moving on to much bigger jobs to keep his guys on site. So I got to make sure that when he comes back and does this driveway, he's doing the curbs at the same time. If not, I'm probably not going to get that done this year or, you know, it's gonna, or I'm going to have to get some other guy to do it that's not as qualified. Sure. So to know this that right ahead to hey, say, hey, I need you to plan for putting curbs in at the same time you're doing this driveway. Whereas a lot of people are kind of just like last second, they notice it and then you got these guys that are operating million dollar equipment that you expect to basically do something in a matter of a days or weeks. This is not gonna happen. Yeah, makes sense. So what's the deal with this rock thing in here? Yeah, so, uh, so these two buildings right here are the boat storage, uh, RV kind of storage units. Mm -hmm. So these are gonna be lean to roofs. So both roofs are gonna drain in. So oh, I got you. Gable style. We need to gonna go off both sides. So we have all this right right here, and then uh, we, we went back and forth whether we wanted to have a drain at the bottom and then go underneath this driveway right to where you're at. Mm -hmm. But we decided to surface drain it here. So basically okay. this is just because I don't want to have somebody mold this tiny little stretch right here. Mm -hmm. So we tarped it and covered it with rocks. And actually, to be honest, it actually looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then that will be all the snow from both these roofs. So basically just fall right in between there. And then as that melts off, we'll go into here. Gotcha. So okay. if it gets to be really, really, really bad, then I can have uh, I can have basically uh, somebody come through with a skid steer to push it, but I, it would have to take a lot of snow. Yeah. So, gotcha. but the the, uh, the good thing about it, though is that um, the way this is kind of set up with this area in between, it's wide enough though that we don't believe we're going to get a ton of snow as it melts off. Mm -hmm. going, you know, because we don't want to melt off underneath. Mm -hmm. 
Gotcha. Now, the, the timeline on this thing, so what date did you first start clearing trees here? And what's the estimated completion date? Just curious how long this whole thing takes from start to finish, especially during this COVID era we're in. So that's a, that's a trademark of basically that, you know, being private that, uh, you know, and also now, you know, with investors and things like that. But we, uh, we started clearing trees in February and we'll be done basically by the end of next month at the latest. Okay. So what is that? Is that like nine months? Um, okay. Like eight months. Eight yeah. months? Gotcha. Or seven months, yeah. Okay, cool. And how long did it take to plan this all out, like civil engineering and all that stuff? I started my planning on this probably about December as mm -hmm. I was kind of buying it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the other thing too as well that we did too, that was, this is actually another reason why I like to go with um, my own deal is that um, we just closed on the construction loan like a week and a half ago. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. So, nice. so you look at that, like, so let's just kind of dig it back. Like, if we are using investor money, I have to have that investor money in before this because especially with rate volatility right now, rate is are going all over the place. Yeah, for sure. And so I have to get that investor money committed like six months before I start my project, especially if I do a large project. Mm -hmm. Whereas on this deal, um, because my client, uh, my partner had a lot of money to advance the draws, we closed the construction loan once we met our equity injection. So well, what that means is that Let's say you do a construction loan and we'll use, uh, we'll use a $1 million. So let's say your construction is $1 million. The bank gives you 75% loan to value. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to require that $250,000 or 25%. That basically gets to be, be paid out of pocket first for you, yeah. and then they start reimbursing you. Mm -hmm. The problem though is then you close a construction loan, unless they gave you they give you 12 months interest only. Well, if it takes me six months to basically meet the equity injection, then that six months of interest only just got wasted. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So what we did to maximize our interest only period is we closed it where I already was over that equity injection requirement. Mm -hmm. So then our very first closing was with the big draw. And it was actually timed up perfectly with the payment on the steel. So we had a half million dollar payment on steel. So we timed those up at the same time, essentially, so that way then we could have it where we max out the interest only period. So on this one, we have two years of interest only. So we're really good at taking advantage of that. And what I say about it too as well, is that with rates where they're at, um, if you have interest only a lot of times on construction, it's a float rate. Mm -hmm. So if we get to profitability very fast, we might decide, you know what, let's lock in a rate before they keep going up. Yeah. So we have that flexibility. Or we just take more cash though, because most people will do, a construction loan, but they're not really actually drawn from it for like three to six months. Yeah. And then that's also kind of a pain too as well, because then, you know, you're using cash for for six months. Uh, and, then you, and then, but then also like, you know, then it makes it even harder to get profitable because you have all these, you know, bank things to deal with too as well. Gotcha. Yeah, for somebody like you who's a proven operator and, you know, you, just, you know what you're doing, could you just go into any bank and get the money you need? Or is it important to work with a specific one who understands the storage industry? Um, you know, um, I'm one. I'm a large deposit holder at the bank I'm at now, so that's obviously always helpful. Uh -huh. You know, it, it's pretty amazing that you know what you can do on a deal. Like, um, you know, I had a deal where uh, a client and partner of mine, we were actually at the negotiations table. We had a ridiculously horrible shortage on our property, and the bank's like, "Well, we want you to come up with the other money." And he, he, the first words out of his mouth is, "How about I deposit a hundred thousand dollars? You guys keep my business, or I take it elsewhere." <laughs> and I was like, "I was like, did he just say that?" And the bank just did whatever he said. So yeah. I am amazed at how much you know you leverage you get these days. You know the kind of thing because you think about it. If you get a lot of exposure with one bank, you know you have millions of dollars of loan. You have millions of dollars of deposits with them. If you get to that point, the bank will pretty much do whatever you need to do to keep your business because they don't want you to get a taste of another uh, company and slowly start going down. Yeah. Are you doing like SBA loans or just conventional? Uh, combination of SBA and conventional. A lot of banks now, especially on new construction because there's obviously a risk, are yeah. trying to offset that risk with SBA. Mm -hmm. The problem though is timing. SBA loans are taking a long time for offsetting that risk. Yeah. So we're doing a combination. We're actually right now actually looking into doing, um, and this is something that uh, anybody's listed as an accredited investor, we're actually looking at doing just a straight debt structure because if we're going to be paying 6.75 percent new construction and i can just go to my investors not deal with sworn statements and all this bank stuff and pay them eight percent and pay them eight percent right away on a straight debt structure then we're considering doing that too as well so we're actually getting to that point now where we're just going to uh, try to just go to investors for the debt event and not even deal with banks at all okay because the rates are getting so high gotcha when, when you've done sba loans is it 7a or 504 
Uh, been a combination of both, but 504 right now is the one that most banks are pushing. Um, and the 7A, uh, unfortunately, is because uh, the, the variable rate on it, that it stays variable for the life of the loan in most cases, um, that is making it very difficult for people to do that. But there's also some tendencies as well. 7A is kind of like a, a it's almost like a Freddie Fannie mortgage product where it can be sold off. So if a bank needs to get loans off their books, it allows them to do more of them. Yeah. Whereas 504, uh, a portion of the loan stays on them. Acting, what people don't know, know about the 504 loan is that the bank is lending us you know, like 85% on, on 85 to 90% but if it's new construction, they actually are carrying that risk until you finish construction yeah. and then SBA kicks in. So they actually have greater risk in the short term. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. Have you ever seen a storage deal fall apart? Like, uh, I don't know, like how often does that happen and why does it happen? The, uh, the most common one I run into, well, it's either that people don't have both the wherewithal to. I have a lot of guys that know how to build storage because they're in the trades, the owner of the company, but they have no idea what to operate. So I have that. That's where a lot of my consulting comes from is people that like, uh, they're like, hey, Charles, like, uh, can you uh, get this facility sold for me? I'm like, okay, cool. So tell me about it. And it's like, oh, it's 8% occupied. We've had it for 18 months. <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? Like, you know, what are you doing? It's like, you know, they just don't know what they're doing at all. And then mm -hmm. it actually decreases the value because then people start questioning like, yeah. They're like, how can be something only be 8%? So that's a common one. Or it's the other way around where, you know, they don't know how to build, but they know a lot about operating. You know, like they may have worked for somebody or they have a property management company, so they have an idea of working with tenants. But uh, we run in those a lot of times where people don't have both pieces. So mm -hmm. at, at Twin Oaks Capital, our company, uh, we, I've, I've done almost everything that I've trained my staff to do. So even though I'm not doing it anymore, I am. And also I'm, I'm constantly talking to other owners. I'm always seeing what other owners are doing. You know, I would say the majority of my time, my work hours spent is working on operational efficiencies. Because, you know, I'm not trying to scale to $200 million of business because, you know, I, I have so much equity in my properties. And if I have 50% equity in 20 million, you know, versus 10% equity in 100 million, that doesn't really matter to me because overall it's the same amount of equity too. Yeah, gotcha.